Hallelujah, praise the name of Jesus Christ. Good morning, brothers and sisters, friends and family. It's good to be here again sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Welcome to our Sunday ministration. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. My name is Pastor Femi Alara of Living in the World International Church, a place where we preach Christ undiluted and we receive the keys to fulfill our destiny. My prayer is that you shall fulfill your destiny in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're joining us for the very first time this month of June, I want to say Happy New Month to you. Uh, we're still in the first week, so I think I'm allowed to say Happy New Month. Um, also, I would like to uh, deliver the prophetic word of the month, which is the month of divine visitation. The Bible makes us understand that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel visited uh, Mary, the mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And um, he delivered the good news that she has been favored and she has been selected to be the one to be the carrier of our Savior into the world. I want you to understand that this month is very crucial for you and I because this is a month of divine visitation for you. And may God visit you uh, in a very specific and special way this month in the precious name of Jesus Christ. I pray for you that you do not miss your hour of divine appointment in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, the pandemic is slowly going away and um, the lockdown is gradually being eased and everybody's getting back to some kind of a routine. And I'm saying they're going to be a new norm obviously after the pandemic but i did tell us that every challenge had an expiry date and we shouldn't make uh, covid 19 at uh, the center of our of, of our lives as many people did and people panicked and people did a lot of things irrational uh things during the um, the height of the covid 19 virus as we begin to get into the norm it's also important that we keep on on the, uh, keep our foot our foot on our on the pedal as we keep charging towards our destiny or destination which God has ordained for us. Um, failure begins by doing nothing. And I pray that you and I will not fail on this path of life in the precious name of Jesus Christ. May God use you as the tool to break and change the history of your generations yet to be born in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, our series of teaching this month is on the subject of family. And we're looking at it in stages. We're looking at singles. We're looking at courtship. And we're definitely looking at marriage. As the three sections of teaching we're going to be looking at this month. Now, I began by laying the foundation on Wednesday, uh, which was the first day of um, the first service of the month. And we looked at the what does it mean to be a single person and um, how before you start saying you want to be in a relationship, what are the things that you ought to do? And one of the things that we discovered is that you actually need to define yourself. Many times when we look at us, ourselves in the mirror, uh, do we actually know who this person is? Many of us, sometimes we simply look at the mirror and we say, yeah, I'm ready for marriage. Do you, can you define this person? And when I say, who are you? I don't mean, what's your name? I don't mean, what do you do for a living? Who are you is a, is a reflection of the totality of you as a person. Now, every one of us here need to understand that and we need to actually go and define ourselves. You cannot give yourself as a suitable helpmate or present yourself as a suitable helpmate to anybody if you cannot define yourself. That is something that is fundamental to everything that you do. We read in the scriptures in the books of Acts chapter 19 verse 16 when the seven sort of skivers went out to cast out demons and they discovered that uh, the demon said, uh, Paul, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, who are you? And suddenly, you know, they find it difficult. When you don't know who you are, you're going to be disgraced. And I pray none of you shall be disgraced in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, today we are looking at part two of this series of teaching. And still yet, we're trying to lay the foundation of being single. Because being single is not being abnormal. It's not something wrong with you. It's a great time within your lifetime that you have an opportunity to develop yourself and become, uh, begin to become a reflection of what God has made you to be. And I'm praying that God will open our eyes of understanding this morning in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now shall we pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for never leaving us, never forsaking us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that has helped us thus far. And thank you Lord, for keeping us safe throughout this pandemic period. Heavenly Father, tonight, this morning as we sit at your feet to hear your word, we ask that you please open our eyes of understanding and that you reveal your perfect counsel to us, to the glory and praise of your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. And praise the name of Jesus Christ. Now, there are many things that we often discover about ourselves uh, when we're single. And some of the things we often learn that we carry on into the adult years of our lives, we often form it or we form the idea or we form the, um, the thinking while we are single. 
And um, you see, the Bible says, do not be deceived. Evil communication corrupt good manners. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33. Many times, when of many of us, we gather together with the wrong set of people. They infiltrate our mind, planting evil thoughts in our heads about what relationship is and what the future holds. And these kind of things actually grows up and begin to contest with the word of God in our hearts. The Bible makes us understand in the books of Matthew chapter 13 about the seed. And when the seed of the word of God falls among thorns, the thorns chokes out the life from the seed and allow the seed not, not to germinate. Now, many people in the world sometimes look at a, a single person as abnormal. You know, I mean, pressures of society, when you hit a certain age, um, you're considered some, something is wrong with you. I mean, for example, people start questioning, your parents might start putting pressures on you and saying, why are you not yet married? I want to meet somebody that you're dating or somebody you're in relationship with. And as a result of that, sometimes you find yourself entangled with the wrong person. And sometimes it might be your grandparents. Oh, I want to see my grandchildren. And stuff like that. And something like that sometimes might push you into doing something that you ought not to do. Some people might even question your, sexual, your sexuality. They might say, are you gay? Are you a lesbian? Is there something wrong with you? Um, are you coming out of the closet? And stuff like that. And things like that sometimes make you feel depressed, oppressed, and sometimes under pressure to just simply marry anybody. I will begin by sharing the story with you, which I, I think might help you. It's a story of a couple who, after two years of marriage, they're about to head for the divorce court. And the reason for their uh, for divorce was because they are simply have irreconcilable differences. And this this was could have been seen or avoided if they actually did the right thing in the beginning. Because oftentimes I've said this, great marriage is built on a great marital ed education. Great marriages are built on great marital educations. And the reason for their divorce was very simple. I can't simply get to him. The lady is shouting. The guy said, well, you feel like I'm, I'm being dominated by a woman. Okay, let me, let me go back into history and try to give you how they met. Now, the lady went out with a, a couple of her friends after they had a big win. She was a corporate lawyer and they had a big major accusation kind of investment deal that they did. And so they went out to the restaurant to celebrate their victory with our friends. Throughout the evening, the chef was very nice to her and, um, you know, gave her extra, ex extra attention, whatever she wanted. She got it almost for free. And, you know, the ladies, our friends noticed that the, the chef was constantly staring at her from the corner of his eyes. And the lady also was glancing occasionally. And eventually, you know, they exchanged numbers and one thing led to another. They went to a few dates. He cooks out a few dinners and so on and so forth. Within a short period of time, they got married. Now, over the time, their differences began to come up. What I mean by that is this. The guy was a chef, and he was a very good chef at that. He works one of the best restaurants in New York. I mean, he was very good at what he does. But the lady was a corporate lawyer, and her mind is very analytical in the, in the sense of that she, when she looks at the news and people are, dis, are discussing topics or, or, or current affairs, she is constantly thinking and analyzing the angles and talking about the legal precedents and all that kind of stuff that makes her very, that sounds very, very intelligent. And the guy is like, yes, there, I understand what you're saying. Yes, there. And he's not engaging her. And she's feeling, whoa, you're just stonewalling me. I mean, try to engage and get involved in this conversation. She's thinking, oh, this guy is no longer interested in me. He's thinking, well, you know what? You're trying to dominate the conversation at all times, or you feel like you have to correct my grammar. You have to do this. You have to do that. What am I saying to you? Sometimes the, the uh, physical compatibility might be great, but the mental and the emotional one, if it's not there, there will be challenges in the future. So that led to many things, and everybody else they decided to go their ways. After a, a very short-lived marriage, which is just barely two years, what am I trying to get across to you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, is very simple. When it comes to being in a relationship or when it comes to being single, you have to take your time to understand yourself, understand what governs a relationship, what governs um, a, a great marriage, what are the th rules that makes the thing work. 
Because if you break the rules, you will fall flat on your face. If somebody thinks he's very spiritual and decides to jump out of the window, I'm sure you're going to meet with the laws of gravity. The laws of gravity were put in place by God, and therefore you are going to hit your head hard on the concrete, that's on, the, on the ground. And this is always the law, regardless of how spiritual or non-spiritual you are. And this is okay. Now, you can pray and fast on every level you want to. And I don't think there's anything wrong in prayer and fasting when it comes to being single. But it's a time that you take to develop yourself and understand yourself. Being single is not abnormal. Jesus was single. Paul was single. John the Baptist was single. They made Mark, they made, they made their imprint on the sand of time. So it doesn't make you abnormal. It doesn't make you um, inferior. It doesn't make you um, feel maybe you are you are a non-entity within the society. I want you to get that straight. So don't let anybody, whether family or friends, put you under pressure when you are not married at a certain age. Because one of the key reasons why many youths, many young adults want to get married is because they think they are they are they're getting old and this this is this is not working. I need to get to a situation where I'm. I'm actually married now. I need to be married now. Now, marriage is not your identity. Marriage only changes your status. Uh, that's just something that is very, very important. The first thing that you have to discover is your identity. Who are you? And I try to lay the foundation for you on Wednesday. Who are you as a person? If somebody was to ask you, who are you? Well, how would you define yourself? Identity is at the bottom of everything that we do. The Bible says that the foundation be destroyed. What can the righteous do? Why do I say this? Now, if you read carefully the books of Matthew chapter 4, and you read the first temptation of Jesus Christ, which is Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, the, 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 the temptation was very, very simple. The devil was clever enough to ask Jesus, do you know who you are? Because what he said was not in those direct words. What he said was this. If you are the son of God, com get, uh, compel this stone to become bread or command this stone to become bread. And Jesus said, well, man should not live by bread alone. The fact is very simple. In the books of Matthew chapter 3, if you look, read the last verse, which I believe is 17, Jesus was publicly announced by a voice that came out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Very, very simple. It came out publicly and it's not something that was hidden. How the, can the devil now all of a sudden, I don't know that this, I can't tell you the length of time uh, between Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 and Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 and uh, 3. But I'm sure it won't be a year. So, because the Bible in some other parts of the scripture says immediately the spirit um, led him to the wilderness. So it won't be, a, uh, it, I don't think it's going to be more than a, a month at most. Take that. I won't say more than a month. So why would the devil be asking Jesus about his identity? Because the moment you forget who you are, you will fall easily for anything. And that's why it's so important as a single person, you define who you are. I want you to understand this. You define who you are. Your identity is not just in your career. Your identity is not just in your name. Your identity is not just in your educational background. Your identity is a summation of who you are. And if you don't know that, and you can't define that well enough, any big Tom and Ari can sweep you off your feet with sweet words and run your, or your, your destiny to the ground. And I pray that will not be your, your, um, your, your portion in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Your identity is found in Christ. And this is something I want us to understand. Now, a few things I believe so strongly that when you're single, you can do. Number one, you have more time for God. That means you can develop your spiritual life. Many people have failed to develop their spiritual life. They're waiting for somebody else to do it. And uh, you see, ask a woman that has three children how much time she has in a day to actually spend time praying without some child tugging on her, on her clothes and saying, I need to eat. Or without a child crying, especially if they're still young, depending what phase of the um, raising of children you're at. If your children are still young, I mean, they're still at three, four years old, five, maybe this kind of age, you'll find yourself constantly in between doing either your 
getting some child to bed, trying to feed a child, some, some child is crying, you're trying to tell a child off, you have no time to actually sit down and say, I want to study my Bible. I just want to read. I just want to fast today. I want to go to his, uh, a quiet place to go and pray for myself, with myself for just for a day or a week. I just want to go away. When you're single, you have those kind of opportunities. You can do that. And the foundation that you dig in the during the formative during your single years, it determines the how high the building you're going to build during your marital years. The foundation that you dig determine how high you're going to build in your marital years, and this is so important. Number two, you develop emotionally. There are a lot of people. It's a sore sight to see a grown man wearing diapers. I mean, it, it now be a very sore sight to see. But you see, many people are not emotionally strong. And that's the honest truth. They still lean on somebody emotionally. And that you'll find out that most people cannot make decisions without consulting certain parties. Some are spiritually soul tied together. And we can get into soul ties maybe um, in one of the teachings on the single part of it. Uh, one of the reasons why delays actually occurs in people's lives when it comes to being single. Um, but just laying the foundation. Some people are emotionally tied to other people. And they're not emotionally strong by themselves. So they find themselves constantly needing that emotional support. And they're not able to be independent. That's why it's so important that during your formative years, you develop your emotional person. Now, the best personality test that you can take as a, a young adult is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, look at the books of Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, Galatians 5, verse 22, and look at, look at it carefully and read how many of those of the fruit of the Spirit have you developed? Have you developed that? There's, I mean, people recommend, and I've seen, and I've done it in the past, where I recommend couples take a personality test and singles take a personality test to develop, the, to determine what kind of person they are. But in most cases, I tell people, take the personality test from the scriptures. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Tell me from those scriptures what your personality is. What area are you yet to develop? If because if those areas are yet to be developed in your life, you will find that you're constantly still emotionally broken. Some people are coming from the back of a bad relationship where they feel they have been cheated and maltreated by their partner in the past and they're still emotionally broken. This allows you to be emotionally matured because believe it or not, marriage is not for fun, is not fun and games. It's really very important that you're emotionally strong to weather through the storm that comes even during the marriage period. Now, number three is that you are financially independent. I mean, a lot of ladies like uh, like their sugar daddies and um, because they're actually able to bankroll them. Financially independent, do you have a job? And um, what do you do for a living? I mean, you might not be the beacon of success yet, and you might not be um, the person, that you, the epitome of success, but you are on your way. For example, you might still be at the entry level um, of the of, of the of the corporate ladder. You might still be in the mid level of the corporate ladder. It depends. I, I don't. I, you can be anywhere, but you have something that you're doing. You're financially independent. You have an income. Some people still have their uh, their hands, or they are they are still handcuffed to the wallet of their parents, and they said they're they're ready for marriage. And I, I find that quite interesting. Some people are going to sugar daddies to get the money because they can't find a job. I mean, yeah, and, and all that kind of things is happening. But you have to be financially independent. Financial independency tells me that you're matured enough to make decisions. It's not how much you're earning. It's the fact that you're earning and you're able to pay your own bills. You're not waiting for somebody else to pay your own bills on time. You're matured enough to, in effect, run your own life. You're paying your own rent. You have a roof over your head. Uh, one of the questions I sometimes ask the lady, have you asked your man? When they tell me they're going, they were, they, they're planning to get married is, have you, do you actually know where you're going to live after you get married? If you're still moving back home to your parents' house after you get married, there's something wrong somewhere. Because the Bible says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. It is said they're going to move back home into their parents' home. I know, I know of a pastor that got married 
And when the first day he got married, his, himself and his wife, they moved into a shared house. Now, this might not be quite common in um, some parts of the world, but a, a shared house is when you have a whole house, maybe with four rooms, and you're renting just a room in the house, not the entire house. You, are, you have access to the rest of the, of the property, i.e. the kitchen, uh, the living room, and so on and so forth, but you actually just live in a room. You don't have access to every part of the house. You have, actually have a room. That's where you sleep. And he said, that's how I began my life with my wife. But today, that the story is different. What I'm saying to you is this. Financial independence is a time during that you develop during your formative years. Because it shows that you have emotional, you have matured enough to handle the affairs of your life. You're not the kind of person that every penny that you earn, you want to use it to gamble. Every penny that you earn, you want to use it to the buy a new pair of shoes that the latest trainers. Every penny that you earn, you are simply wasting it. You have shown that you have been wise enough, matured enough to put something aside for the rainy day where you can actually use for whatever comes your way or actually planning to buy your own house. That tells me that you're ready for the next stage. So financial independence. Number four, number four professional independence. Uh, I tried to allude to this earlier, which is to actually make sure that you actually have a job. The Bible says, he that does not work must not eat. Um, that is what the scripture says. I didn't write the Bible. It's what the Bible says itself. Now, you and I must have a job, a source of income. And these are the things that you need to sort out. It's easy for you to go out and... Um, how do I put it? Hustle, if I want to use that word, when you're single. When you have mouths to feed or you have people that are dependent upon you as, as a family man, it's completely different. You have a different set of variables that is governing your life. And it's so important that as young adults, you begin to actually get these factors right in your life. And then last but not the least is this, number five. You must be physically grown. I mean, not only mentally matured physically, you're able to deal with the issues that are around you. I mean, you have a body. There's a story of an evangelist that I read about many, many years ago. He died at the age of 32. And after he died, on his deathbed rather, um, he said something that was quite interesting. And um, what he said was this. He said, God has given me a great uh, a horse and I killed it. He was referring to his body. Because he never looked after his body. He, he, he ate poorly. Um, he fasted too long. He did all kinds of things to his body. And his body eventually died. And he, God was using him mightily. I mean, he was raising the dead. He was healing the sick. The lame was walking in his revivals and stuff. So, and things like that. He died at the age of 32. What am I saying to you? Many people don't look after their body now. And they have to pay the price in the future. Um... I pray none of you ever get sick. But if you have the privilege and the chance to actually see people who are actually in the hospital, who are young, some of them are in their 40s, some of them are in their 50s, and you can see how sickness is destroying not only their life, but the life of their husband or their wives or their children, it would really, really begin to dawn on you how much you have to look after your body physically. I often tell couples when they actually plan to get married to go and get tested. Not just the HIV and the pregnancy test, but to actually look at their blood groups. If there's any disease that they need to be worried about, because then you can actually plan accordingly for the future. Every one of us here have the opportunity now to start having healthy, uh, exercising and trying to live a life so that we don't live our latter years in in ill health. Yes, we can pray and fast. Yes, we can lay hand. Yes, the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. And, and I believe those scriptures. I really do. But you cannot violate natural laws and expect supernatural laws to work for you. This is one of the biggest mistakes that we still have in the body of Christ. Many people feel they can violate natural laws. Yes, the supernatural laws actually supersede the natural laws, no doubt. But God is the author of the natural laws. If you read the, uh, the books of Genesis carefully, God authored the books of Genesis. And he's the one that wrote the natural laws of day and night. 
times and season. He's the one that wrote the laws of gravity into existence. It was always been there by God. Nobody discovered gravity. Gravity was always in existence. Or else every one of us will be floating in the air. And we won't be able to walk on the ground. But gravity was always there. Only somebody discovered it. Isaac Newton. And, and so what I'm saying to you is God is the author of natural laws. And it must not be broken. You can't expect God to supersede his natural laws with um, supernatural laws. Except you yourself have obeyed the natural laws. Now, I think we, we will lay the bare foundation again today. Um, there's so many aspects of our lives that we are yet to touch. A few reflections I think we have to take away from here today is this. As I begin to close the sermon for this morning. Is number one, if I define myself correctly, do I have an identity in Christ? Am I under pressure to get married? Do you feel pressure to get married? And where is the pressure coming from? Is it from family? Is it from your parents? Is it from your grandparents? Is it from the society? Is it from your friends? Then number three is that you ask yourself the very simple question, have I developed enough? I've mentioned about five areas that I feel so strongly that you need to look at. Uh, financial dependence, professional independence, emotional independence, and, and things like that, because it helps you be able to define yourself. Number four is your, it's your um, foundation well dug. People build shallow foundations or dig shallow foundation and expect to be skyscrapers. This is a recipe for disaster. You don't need a prophet to tell you that that's about to fail. Because when you begin to get into the relationship and you begin to get into things that has to do with marriage, the foundation that you've dug will either help you or it will destroy you. What I mean by that is this. If you're not a strong Christian, and I use an example, and you happen to meet somebody um, who's a lukewarm Christian, and they begin to give you all kind of meat um, about, for example, sex. And they say, well, everybody's doing it. Why don't I do it? Well, why don't we do it? Uh, if you love me, why don't you have sex with me? And things like that. What happens is that you're easily swayed. The Bible says, do not be equally yoked with unbelievers. It's in 1 Corinthians 6, 6 verse 14. Um, you find yourself that it's e you're easily swift to decide what everyone else is doing it i remember a young lady many years ago it says she said something to me that was quite interesting she said to me well do you go to a shop and buy a trousers without trying it on i said no obviously that's why you have a changing room in the shop and you go in there and try how you see how it fits he said okay if that is the case then why do you think that I should get married to a man that I've not tried him first in bed to see how good he is because I, I don't know if he's, he's going to be able to satisfy me. And I said, that's very good. I mean, it makes logical sense if you look at it from a, a natural man point of view. But you see, the problem is the Bible says that when you when you actually join yourself to a prostitute, you become one to a prostitute with a prostitute. The fact is... Many people have had spirit transference into them through sexual intercourse. Many people have had STDs through sexual intercourse. There have been so many un unwanted pregnancies through sexual intercourse and aborted baby, which is murder in the first place. There, there have been people who have been so tied to people from the past. And this has been the pattern. And then you ask yourself, if you get on the wrong bus, you're going to end up in the wrong destination. So men are not like bus that comes at the bus stop. That's why you have to make decisions very consciously. Now, I leave you with this thought. I leave you with this thought. And this is something I want you to think about deeply. Do I know myself well enough? And am I ready for the next phase of my life? Because if you're not, eventually you'll be found out. And I hope you're not found out to be a fraud. God bless you. Shall we pray? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We just want to thank you this morning again for your word that's come forth with life and power. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that's come into our midst to help us to hear your word 
and to explain your word into, even to our hearts. And I pray, Lord God of heaven, that none of this word be here today shall, um, shall stand against on Judgment Day, Lord. I pray that it shall, it shall be for our benefit, that each and every one of us will continue to develop, even in our stages of life, wherever we are. I pray we will not fall to the hands of the enemy. I pray that our footsteps shall be ordered throughout the month. I pray as we go forth this week, Lord, you will go ahead of us and give us victory in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Savior. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday for our midweek service. And we look at part three of the sermon on singles. God bless you. Good night.